Jim Clouk on the Beach Money Podcast. Hopefully you're having a beach money day. That could be that you may be sitting on the beach, walking on the beach. Maybe you're in the mountains. Maybe you're just sitting on your uh, couch reading a book. Whatever beach money means to you. Jordan Adler brings this program to you each and every week with my help. He's asked me to host the program, and this is a fantastic opportunity for me to get to know Jordan's inner circle who he spends a lot of time with, the people he respects, and other associates in his inner circle. Jared Yellen, welcome to the program. How are you? Uh, honored to be here. I uh, love what you're doing with Jordan. I love Jordan. I'm excited to add some value to your wonderful community. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. I know you've known him for some time. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the history with you and Jordan Adler? Yeah, I'm happy to. So um, years ago, I launched a company called Synduit. It's a marketing software for small business owners. And the first industry we launched in to stabilize was the chiropractic profession. I have a lot of relationship capital there with leaders in the industry. And that was my entree into stabilizing this now rather profound software solution. But after chiropractic, I had this goal of getting to 10,000 users quickly. And I started to do a pretty extensive analysis of where can we launch next to get that kind of volume. And I mean like fast. And the industry that stood out as the most likely to create that outcome was the network marketing profession, which I knew nothing about at the time. So I started just doing a lot of research, reaching out to leaders of companies that I just found within my research. And literally every single person I spoke with, when I asked them one question, which is who's the guy or gal that is the industry? Like they are the poster example of what's possible in the industry, every one of them said George Heller. And I didn't know Jordan at the time. So I ended up going on Facebook and just messaging him and saying, hey, Jordan, everybody that I've met in the profession, all of your friends have said, you're the guy. I just want to understand how you've done it. So we had a really nice conversation. I learned more about him, what he, what he did to get to the point where he's at, impacting literally millions of lives, both in the direct selling industry as an author, as a consultant, and we just became really good friends. And there was no business relationship between us other than I had deep levels of respect for how well he lives with integrity. And as time went on, he was tracking what I was doing in the software industry. And a couple of years ago, he reached out and he said, I just wanna really dig into where you are and where you're going with your current project. And he made an investment at that point to become one of our shareholders inside of Project 10K. So one thing I've always said about Jordan is that he is the single most intentional person I have ever met in my life in the space of human connection. 100% of the people that he has introduced me to with no agenda whatsoever, something has come from it. And I just have the deepest level of respect for people that bring intentionality to whatever they do. And he brings immense intentionality to relationship capital. I agree. Uh, Jordan is a great connector. He really cares about people. And he knows that in small business, as an entrepreneur, um, as a solopreneur, your your value really are your connections, right? And and so it's really important to to have them. But what's really great, though, is someone like Jordan who's able to match up people. He matched us up for this podcast, for instance. He felt you would be great on the podcast, obviously felt you and I would be a good connection to talk about what you do. And it it really goes back to network marketing, doesn't it? It, it goes back to being able to connect people. And it is, it is a process over time. And you and I have similar stories as to how we met Jordan. And once you meet Jordan Adler, by the way, if you don't know who he is, once you meet him and he brings you in, you will be part of his world. And I'll tell you one thing. I read a study a long time ago that said you can only have so many close connections. It, it's in the hundreds. It's not in the thousands or ten thousands. Jordan Adler somehow has been able to go outside that ring. Yeah, I've seen it too. We spent quite a bit of time together now as well. And the depth that he has with me, he has with most people, which is just a testament to how much he cares and how serious he takes that asset, which are relationships. And and I, I applaud him for it. I mean, the industry of network marketing, I've personally been involved. I've supported a lot of companies just as a, 
as a vendor to those companies in the software space. Um, but the industry has evolved so dramatically with how leaders are now building their businesses. And the one thing Jordan has done is he has just stood firm on the foundation of what it takes to build a viable business in the network marketing industry, which is caring about humans. And there's 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 nothing other than that within Jordan. Like he has built an empire truly by caring about each individual person that he supports. And it was interesting, the other day he reached out, he asked if um, our company would just set up an account um, with send out cards because that's a, something that we need. Like we send cards to our shareholders and our founders and things like that. And I'm like, yeah, of course we'll set it up. So we set up the account and he onboarded the person on my team. And I'm like, this is so Jordan. Like yeah. he definitely didn't need to do that. Like we're a software company. We have very agile people. And he got on a phone call with the person, onboarded them, explained how it worked, helped them send out their first card. And that's the level of attention that he puts and intention that he puts on relationships. And it has gone a very long way for him. And that's the reason that he has so many people that just deeply care about who he is in their lives. He, he is certainly one of the top people in the industry, literally in the business he's in and send out cards. He's way at the top. Everyone knows who he is, but he's not one of these people at the top who won't talk to the little people, right? Everyone is an important person in Jordan's life. And that's really important to know. So if you're watching this and you don't know who Jordan is, get ready, Jordan. You're going to get a bunch of friend requests. Here. <laughs> Reach out to him on social media, and I'm sure he will respond back to you. Now, you like Jordan Adler didn't start off great with your business ventures. I know Jordan, it took him a very long time to become successful. People think people are an overnight success and they'll say, no, it was 30 years in the making. Um, and I know his early on endeavors in network marketing didn't pan out, um, but his last one really has panned out with send out cards. You have a similar story, right? You've learned a lot and now you want to help 10,000 other tech companies. Tell us about that. So I I realized really early in life that I was completely and utterly unemployable. So I never tried and I went all in on entrepreneurship. Um, and I've had a pretty solid run for the past 18 years with some beautiful learning experiences sprinkled throughout. I'm what you call a non-tech tech founder. So what that means is there is not an engineering bone in my body. I know how to write marketing copy and I really know how to sell. And somehow, some way I did everything that you could conceivably do wrong while building a B2B SaaS platform. SaaS is software as a service, but I landed on my feet and the company is relatively successful today, but I'm kind of the poster example of what you shouldn't do. So many years ago, I had this idea for marketing software for small business owners. And I approached a few of my friends that are already in the software industry. And I said to them, where should someone like me go with an idea like this? And they said, Jared, you have to hire a really strong MarTech, marketing technology, software development firm. There's one in Boston that we previously worked with are the best. We'll introduce you to their founder. It's a big firm, so you really do want to speak with them. So I ended up speaking with the founder. We really hit it off. And he said to me in that first meeting, here's how we work. It's a $25,000 fee to engage our company. I will assign a product manager to you for two months, and they're going to assemble the most comprehensive statement of work you've ever seen. And then you can go and shop it around. And if you choose to hire us, you don't have to, but if you choose to, we'll roll the $25,000 into your first invoice. But here's what I want to do for you. I really believe in where you're going with this. I want to waive that fee, but don't feel obligated to hire us. I just want to know that I contributed to the foundation of your success. So I took him up on this very gracious offer. And on day 61, I couldn't fathom going anywhere else because they just knew so much about this vision. So I'm like, you're it. Or I'm going to hire you. What is it going to take? And they said 10 months and $750,000 to build the first version of this vision. And my challenge at that time was I was relatively young and I was pretty well capitalized because I had an exit right when I graduated from college and I was running a very lucrative marketing agency. So I figured I'm just going to self-fund this. I really believe in it. Let's get it going. So I did. And the 10 months and $750,000 turned into over two years and over $2 million. And then at the point of launching, I learned a term that I did not know then, Jim, I'll now never forget, which is called technical debt. And what that means is the engineers had cut so many corners, it's inevitable the platform will implode. It just comes down to when. And my when, unfortunately, was at launch. So I had to make this hard decision, which was abandon the vision, 
grow our band in two years and $2 million and start over. And I could not fathom abandoning the vision because I just so knew there was a need in the market for the solution. And I also knew how to bring it to the market. I just needed someone to build it. And I was apprehensive at the same time to burn my hand on the stove for a second time. So I did this exercise where I said, okay, it's clear what I've lost, which is time and money. <laughs> Whenever you lose something, you gain even more if you're willing to shift your focus to what you're gaining. So I'm like, what did I gain? And what I gained in that moment has been the catalyst for the rest of my career because it was an understanding that you can't outsource software development at that early stage. Somehow, some way, you have to build your own team of engineers who shares your values. It's non-transactional. They either have ownership or they see a path to ownership. And I couldn't figure out how to do that with outsourcing. So my fanatical focus became building my own team of engineers, but I was smart enough to know I had to find a strong CTO. So I was living in North New Jersey at that time, and there was a gentleman in my town that was a sought after CTO. I did not know him, but people heard I was searching. They introduced us to one another. We really hit it off. And after about four months of vetting one another, I gave him an economic offer. He just couldn't refuse. And he joined me the next day. And we started building our own team of engineers in the US, in Canada, and then also in India. He was originally from India. So we had relationships, but more importantly, he just knew how to find the kind of talent that we needed. So we were finally on track in 2017. I set up a company in India just to provide a better quality of life to our current team and to get more and better talent. And that was my catalytic move for that business, which is called Sinduit. It's a marketing software for small business owners. We've since scaled to, to tens of thousands of users across 30 industries. But the magic of the story, and this is the, really the turning point for me to try to help other people do what I just did, it happened about three years ago when I woke up one day and realized I'm officially obsolete at Sinduit. And as you and your audience knows, that's the dream of the entrepreneur, or at least in my opinion, it should be. That's the beach money lifestyle right there. So I was very excited about the accomplishment. I was just assessing, what am I going to do next? I was 35 years old at the time, two young kids who's had our third recently, happily married, with a very nice lifestyle. And I realized for me, the next chapter, it had to be my moonshot. I had to do something that would completely shake up the world or I was going to go down trying. And as I started digging into that, Jim, I did this exercise. I recommend that everybody does this. I call it a life audit. And what I was auditing was opportunity cost. Because when I went all in on Sinduit, I went all in on Sinduit. And I said no to anything that could remotely distract me, even things that may have eventually been bigger than Sinduit. I wanted to revisit what those things were. And I found this consistent theme over those five years, which is every single month, I had at least a dozen and some months, even a few dozen entrepreneurs pitching me their software ideas, concept phase only, or engineers showing me their minimum viable products. And they found me because I'm pretty active and accessible in a few different communities, but they were pitching me for two distinct reasons. One is I'm the non-tech, now tech founder that somehow pulled this off. And more importantly, I built the infrastructure they were going to eventually have to build for themselves. I own my own software development firm. I have my own marketing agency. I figured out business development and I have operations completely locked in. And they really wanted my feedback. And as I'm sure you could imagine, nearly every idea on MVP was completely ridiculous and not viable, but there was 12 of them over those five years that were epic. And I told each of the entrepreneurs and the engineers, I said, listen, I don't have a crystal ball, but if I was you, I'd be pursuing this. Like you're onto something. And every time I would say that their immediate request was, will you do it with me? And unfortunately I had to decline. because I was very focused on sin do it. And then they would say, okay, but we at least use a portion of your team, which I really declined because we were really focused on sin do it. So three years ago, when I was sitting there and thinking to myself, what's my next move? I figured, let me call these 12 entrepreneurs Maybe I can help one or two of them get to where they want to get to faster. And what I learned was so disheartening. 11 of the 12 did literally nothing from that conversation going forward, which in my opinion means they're going to die with their greatest song inside because these were really good opportunities. And one of the 12 tried, but they had the same experience I had. They just didn't rebound. They lost over $300,000 to a software development firm and said they would never do it again. And in that moment, I realized my calling is to help 10,000 entrepreneurs go from napkin to exit, which led to the birth of Project 10K. That's an amazing story. And it's an amazing opportunity for individuals who have this little nugget that can grow 
you know, snowball to something important. And so as you were talking, Jared, I was thinking it's kind of like if I have a unit um, in a business, you know, a small business unit, and this may be a little more mature than some of the people that come to you, but I want to franchise it. But I don't know anything about franchising. So I need to work with someone who knows how to take the one unit and multiply it. It's similar to that, isn't it? It's a great example. So our our traditional, what we call co-founder, is a mature professional coming from an industry. So maybe they're like Ron Nussbaum, our founder of Builder Toms, who was running a eight-figure construction company and then realized that the construction industry has this massive inefficiency when it comes to communication between the contractor and the homeowner, which led to the birth of builder comps. Or maybe it's like Tiffany Middle, our co-founder of a company called Utility Ranger, who realized that smaller multifamily real estate investors really had a hard time with utility management within their investment property. So the point of it is our founders are people that have come from an industry They've identified an inefficiency in the industry. They know the industry. They are the end user to the eventual solution that we create together. They come through our process, and then we do extensive due diligence to ensure four things. Right person, right idea, right market, right business model. There's a ton of nuance to that, but when that is present, we will launch a business with that entrepreneur. So it's the same premise, but very specific into the inefficiencies within industries There happens to be tens of thousands of inefficiencies within industries. So there's no shortage of opportunity for us. What's unique about what we've built is we have unmatched human infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So we truly become a co-founder in these businesses. We are the engineers, the product managers, the marketers, the business development specialists. We are the team doing all the back office operations from accounting to bookkeeping to legal to investor relations. So we've just built really unique infrastructure with the goal of eliminating suffering in early stage tech. Because the darkest period of my life was when I attempted to do this by myself because I'm non-technical and I had no one to go to to ask, is this normal? Like, should my invoices be $100,000 a month, sometimes $200,000 a month? Like, I feel like there's no progress being made, but I'm told that there is. Like, I had nowhere to go for a trusted source of information. And once I made it and we have this very viable business called Send to It, I realized that most people, they won't even have the courage or the resources to start. And if they do, most likely they're going to end up in what I call the Bermuda Triangle of entrepreneurship, which is where most great ideas, specifically software ideas, land. Because if you don't have the right people around you, you can't pull off launching a tech company. It's not something that you can do by yourself. This sounds like Shark Tank tech version i can picture you right i can picture you on the panel and when it comes to someone who who walks in onto stage with this morsel of a tech idea you're that shark who says we have everyone there just like mark cuban has built all you know his team and they bring in these companies right is it similar to that where you same concept and like and like realize everything that's on Shark Tank, every company that you're every one of you currently use that you can't imagine living without, every one of those things started as a concept written on a piece of paper. Like you can't bypass that step. That's the origin of everything. Like, like the greatest companies of all time, the Ubers of the world, the Googles of the world, the Apples of the world, the Facebooks of the world, they all started just as, a, as an insight, as a concept. And then there was enough people that galvanized energy around them to turn these companies into empires that we can't live without today. Well, that's what we're motivated to doing, is catalyzing those ideas, providing a safe place for them to get brought to life. And we're not necessarily looking for each of these individual companies to become the next billion dollar exit. I'm sure we'll have plenty of them. But what we're really focused on is what no one else seems to focus on, which is what we call the singles and the doubles. The businesses that we can build, scale, create free cash flow. So we're actually paying out dividends to shareholders and to founders as we're going towards an exit. Because one of the things that I've learned is there's this huge industry called venture capital. And venture capital is for a fraction of a fraction of a percentage of accredited investors. And the reason for it is because most people can't withstand seven to 10 years of C return. They can't even imagine putting a quarter million dollars into something and literally getting nothing back for a decade. So that's a fraction of a fraction of the people that are able to invest. 
Whereas most people are looking for things that create cash flow. So that's why they invest in multifamily real estate, because in multifamily real estate, you have tenants that are paying you rent. So you're creating cash flow. So it feels like your money's working for you, which it is, but you're not going to get oversized returns in multifamily real estate. It's just a more stable investment for you. So I've always said, why can't you have it both ways? Why can't you run capital efficient software companies that are paying out cash flow to shareholders while simultaneously benefit from the multiples that exist in tech? And that's exactly what we're doing at Project 10K. So you're going to not just have 10,000 tech companies, you are going to make thousands of millionaires. I know you didn't want to talk about the money side. Yeah. But well, we will. No, we'll talk about it. We're, we are, we, we believe that, like, this is a great example. So one of the things that we've come to realize is that many founders early stage, they are more of a liability than an asset. And the reason we say that is because they're too passionate about their idea and they see no fault in it. And that gets in our way because the reason we've accomplished what we've accomplished is we're unemotional about any idea. All that we care about is the data. And for us, the data that matters is cash flow. And it's not that we're ruthless capitalists, but if the company isn't making money, it's not doing any good in this world. So we really measure that very seriously. So we, yes, we intend, and we won't stop at 10,000 companies. Like that's when it got easy. So this will go on forever. This is a legacy play, not for me, but for generations and generations to come to have a safer place to bring their tech ideas to life. But we are motivated to produce, I mean, tens of thousands of millionaires over the next few hundred years, leveraging what we've built here, which is a process and system that is completely repeatable to turn a concept into a cash flowing asset, reducing risk for all parties that are involved and increasing the chance of generating free cash flow, both for the founder and the shareholder of each individual company. It sounds as though, Jared, you are helping a lot of people live their dream because without you and your back end, and I know back end is not fair to say, but it it, it kind of yeah. is a back end. They have the the upfront idea and you guys bring it to fruition. Um, there are a lot of people out there who couldn't fulfill their life's dreams because they don't have the infrastructure and the experience you have. And I would imagine, Jared, the more you do it, the better you guys become yeah. and really the easier it is because we learn from experience. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. So the first 10 companies felt like, impossible, like the most Herculean thing of my life. Company 11 was the first time that it got easier. And I said to my team, we're onto something. Company 50 was easier than company 11. And I'm positive company 5,000 will be easier than company 50. So it is getting easier. Part of it is we've just created operational efficiency. Part of it is we just know what it takes to start generating cash flow. And the moment you generate cash flow, it does get easier, not easy, but easier. So we just know what that takes to get to the point of generating cash flow. Part of it is we become more selective on what we're saying yes and no to. So if, we, if we're if we not 100% certain that we can pull it off, we just won't speculate. It isn't worth it. We've also gone a little bit upstream now. So we're not just starting at concept phase, but we're also blessing engineers that have built really strong minimum viable products that are generating a thousand or two thousand dollars a month, but they really can't take it any further than that. We're acquiring either most, if not all, of those assets and then taking them on a journey to really scale to create more cash flow and then ultimately an exit as well. So we've learned a lot over the past, we'll call it three years of this project. I would say probably about 95% of what we did didn't work, but the 5% that did work really worked. And it has allowed us to, to live and share this story. And we're really on to something here. Um, it's a very exciting project. We have a lot of people that are involved at this point, like Jordan, people that are high integrity, very successful, extremely well networked, that just believe that entrepreneurship solves every problem that exists in humanity. And they see this project as a conduit to help humanity. Whether that means we're actualizing someone's dream as an entrepreneur or building a solution to a challenge that exists in their life, either personally or professionally, that's stealing time or money and one of our companies can then give them back time and or money. That's why people are getting involved with this project. It's really a force for good. And we tell people all the time, we measure ROI. But for us, the R is the economic return and the I is the impact. And that's really how we make decisions. Will we make money and do good at the same time? If not both, we won't do it because those are the two things that are absolutely foundational to us. Project 10K, 10,000 tech companies. How long is this going to take for you to achieve that? And when you do achieve it, are you going to then up it to 15, 20? Yeah, we're going to rebrand to Project Infinity because we just won't stop. There but, you go. Um, it's funny. We, we used to say 10 years. 
Um, and, and, and we reverse engineered how we were going to get there. And we dropped the 10 years more because it was creating an unnecessary pressure mm -hmm. on us hitting a certain KPI that didn't actually matter. And we were saying yes to things that we probably should not have said yes to. So we dropped the 10 years because maybe it'll be four years. And maybe it'll be 22 years. All that I know is this is a forever project. We're never going to sell Project 10K. It's going to live on forever. I tell all of our shareholders take your investment in our company and put it in a trust that you give to your heirs so that your heirs can take this company once we're done with it. This will just go on. This is a, just a better way to do entrepreneurship. We've built an ecosystem and at the foundation of the ecosystem is one word and it's really not a word. It's a way of life at Project 10K and it's together. And we say together we achieve more and we've proven this now because entrepreneurship is a very isolating journey. It's the reason I think network marketing is so special because when somebody does get involved in the profession, they're not on an island by themselves. Like there's a team surrounding them, there's leaders surrounding them, like, like success leaves clues so you can follow the path that others have already paved for you. If you do the work, most likely you'll at least achieve something. Um, well, that's beautiful that the network marketing profession has that, but early stage tech does not have that. It is a very lonely, isolating journey that is riddled with pain and suffering and the investment to make it happen in early stage tech is exponentially more than network marketing. So people's lives are ruined when they pursue their tech dream. No one's life is ruined when they pursue a network marketing opportunity. So what we've done is we've built an ecosystem and we're seeing the most incredible data come from this ecosystem where certain companies in our ecosystem have the exact same end user. They're just doing different things for the end user. So it still has to be two different companies, but as a byproduct, they collaborate as if they're one and they're so much more powerful together than they are alone. And we're still early. So I still consider us like a zygote on this journey. So I can't even imagine what that looks like at company 1,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 or 50,000. The level of synergy, one plus one equals something way more than two is absolutely profound in this project. Project 10K, Jared Yellen, thank you so much for joining me here today on the Beach Money Podcast. I appreciate it. I'm going to have information in the show notes, everybody, so you can reach out to Jared. Anything else you want to add to that, Jared? I'm just honored to be here. I love what you're doing with Jordan. Um, for all of you, if you're just hearing of Jordan for the first time, go get his book, engage in his work. This is an absolute force for goodness, man. I really have met very few people that have no ulterior motive at all other than leaving a positive imprint in every person's life that they meet. And that's Jordan Adler. So get his book, get involved in his work and wonderful job with what you're doing here at the podcast. Thank you so much. And uh, Jared, actually, uh, we have a link to Jordan's book in the show notes. Jared Yellen, thank you so much again. I really appreciate your time. Awesome. Thank you.